Uh, it's our, <clears throat> our privilege to have Todd Compton with us tonight, um, coming from the Bay Area. Uh, and Todd, as you already know, uh, has produced some magnificent uh, books of history. And uh, he's, he's sort of, uh, should I use the word legendary? <laughs> no, definitely he says no. Um, Todd has quasi-legendary. Quasi -legendary. I mean, he writes about people who are legendary, such as Jacob Hamlin uh, and those women who may or may not have been plural wives of Joseph Smith. Just kidding. Um, oh, you've got them over there. I do. This is the book that Todd will be talking about tonight, uh, A Frontier Life, Jacob Hamlin, Explorer and Indian Missionary, uh, published by the University of Utah Press. A, a very nice looking volume. Um, I just want to read, uh, I, I cannot possibly get away with not reading uh, one of the uh, blurbs uh, from our very own Brian Buchanan, wherever he is. There he is. Oh, why would I think you're anywhere other than behind the camera? I'm sorry. I do not know that. Uh, Brian reviewed this for AML, uh, Association for Mormon Letters. And he says, Todd Compton's eye for detail, obvious in his previous writing projects, is evident here also. Jacob Hamlin's eventful life has finally received a fitting chronicle. Um, I don't know, did Gary Topping stay? or He came in earlier. Uh, he wrote this about uh, this new volume. A magnificent new biography, which will immediately become not only the standard biography of Jacob Hamblin, but also one of uh, the greatest biographies in the fields of Mormon and Utah history, exhaustively researched and documented and judiciously interpreted. Uh, Todd is also uh, a recent, very recent recipient of uh, the Dale Morgan Award. Uh, he also won the Juanita Brooks Award. Um, Todd, as you know, uh, is the author of in Sacred Loneliness, The Plural Wives of Joseph Smith, and that was published by Signature Books. Uh, we have several people here tonight with Signature or uh, the Smith Pettit Foundation. Uh, also, Fire and Sword, which uh, was uh, the genesis of which was done by Leland Gentry a number of years ago, and Todd uh, updated and, and crafted this into a fine book. Uh, this is the history of the Latter-day Saints of Northern Missouri. Um, and we may or may not be out of those at this point, but we can get more very soon. Uh, <clears throat> I asked Todd, I, I've never been really cl exactly clear on what he did for a living besides write uh, history, and uh, he, he's at a law firm uh, in the Bay Area, and uh, I can't remember the, the highfalutin title, but he says he does computer stuff. So... Um, <laughs> We're very happy to have Todd Compton with us tonight as our special guest, and we invite your attention, and uh, in about a half hour or so, uh, we'll open it up to questions. We, I, I do want to make a public apology here. We were going to try to, uh, to have a, uh, a projector here for Todd. He wanted to do a PowerPoint, and unfortunately that didn't work out, so he's going to do it. Uh, he's going to do plan B, but he's very well prepared and we're excited to have him here. And thank you again for coming. Can, can you hear me now? Oh, that's yeah. good. Okay, that's very good. Okay, well, um, thanks for having me, Kurt, and the people here at Benchmark, and um, thanks for your blurb, Brian, <laughs> and thanks for coming, everyone, and a lot of old friends and some people I've never met, so it's that's one of the nice things about signing books is you get to meet new people. Oh, even Marin's here. Hi, Marin, back there. 
and her new husband can. Um, okay, well, um, I'm going to make this fairly informal. I do have some topics, some points to, to deal with. Um, but, uh, so I won't be reading a paper or anything like that. Uh, first of all, uh, it's always interesting to find out how books started, how you started researching the subject. And um, uh, a while back, my parents re retired to St. George, and so we'd have family gatherings there. I'd visit them periodically. Uh, I'm from northern Utah, and um, they became missionaries. My mother and father became missionaries, and uh, my father is back there someplace. I can, there he is. Yeah. And um, so as as one of the missionaries down there, he would do tours through the Jacob Hamplin House. And that's one of the historical landmarks in southern Utah. And because he was doing that, um, Dad collected a lot of information on Jacob Hamlin. And I got, I got interested in um, his life. And so I decided, oh, maybe I'll read a book about him. Let's see if we can find a good scholarly book about Jacob Hamlin. And there were three or four books about Jacob Hamlin, but none of them were, were scholarly. And uh, I remember I took the one by Paul Bailey, what was it called, Jacob Hamlin, Buckskin Apostle. And I was reading through it, and you know, there's a lot of dialogue in, in the book. And I was thinking, wow, there must be some great diaries that included all of this dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so later I went and looked at some of those diaries. There was no dialogue in the diaries. He had just made up the dialogue. <laughs> and, you know, to me, it was like, no, that is a sin. That's one of the cardinal sins. <laughs> and um, Juanita Brooks did, did a little biography of Jacob Hamlin, and she also succumbed to this temptation to make up dialogue. And, um, there was another one by Preston Corbett, published by Deseret Book, and it was kind of really oriented toward the family, and it had strengths and weaknesses. But aside from everything else, it was really out of date. Since it was published, and since a lot of these books were published, there's been like a flood of new documents available in many archives, and especially in our church archives, uh, LDS church archives here in Salt Lake City. And so I started gathering material on Jacob Hamlin, seeing what the you know what the, the primary documents had to say about him, and I. I found out that, con uh, as opposed to many frontiersmen, he he wrote quite a bit. He wrote a number of letters. He he wrote he hand wrote uh, a little autobiography. Uh, he wrote um, diaries throughout his life, not all through his life, but periodically he would he would keep a diary. And that's a kind of a contrast to someone like uh, Kit Carson, who couldn't couldn't read or write. Um, and so. Uh, there was a basis for a, a good scholarly biography of Jacob Hamlin, and so uh, I started. I also, after I wrote In Sacred Loneliness, I kind of wanted to go in a little bit different direction, and so I wrote a book about a man and a book about one person. And also, I've always been interested in um, Mormon-Indian relations, and of course, Jacob Hamlin really allowed me to get in, into that. Uh, and for all these reasons, uh, that's how the book came into being. And um, after that, it's just the old boring business of going to different archives and, and um, tracking down everything else other people have written about Jacob Hamlin and tracking down you know, footnotes, all that kind of detective work. It's a lot of fun, um, but takes a lot of time. Um, okay, uh, so um, some people know about Jacob Hamlin, but a lot of people don't have a background on who he is, so I'll, I'll give you a little short biography of his life. Uh, he was born in the East, born in Ohio, and, and one of the older sons in a, a large family. Uh, and he converted to Mormonism, and uh, he kind of helped bring his whole family in, into the church, and he came to Nauvoo, and um, and he did not come to Utah immediately, but around 1851, he crossed the plains, came to Utah. And the first place he was assigned was to go to Tuella, 
uh, west of here in Salt Lake City. And Tuella is where he first had a lot of um, experience working with Indians. But his first experience was as a military leader. He was uh, a lieutenant in the Nauvoo Legion. And so uh, there were a number of, uh, there was a lot of cattle in the grasslands around Tuella that Mormons had. And uh, Indians, sometimes Utes, sometimes Goshutes, would steal the cattle, take them away. And, um, and so the Mormons would send out uh, little military groups to try to recover the cattle and punish the Indians. And the, the first major experience in Jacob Hamlin's life as a um, person who was involved with the Indians was when he was sent to punish a number of Indians one time. They, they had stolen some cattle. And so uh, in a previous um, event, he had kind of been kind to the Indians. He had um, brought them back to Tuella and given them blankets and so on. And, and uh, his military superior said, okay, we don't want any more of this kind of thing. Uh, we want you to go out, punish these Indians, kill these Indians. And so that's what he thought, well, he's my superior. Maybe I wasn't right in the way I, I dealt with the Indians last time. Maybe I better go out and kill these Indians. So he took a group of, of um, friends, uh, military people with him, and they went out to where Grantsville is now, and they um, had a, a friendly Indian with them to help them track these Indians who had stolen the cattle, and um, they found the, the track, and very early in the morning they found out where these Indians were camped. Um, and so they made a head-on charge to these Indians, and of course the camp of Indians just scattered through the mountains. Jacob Hamlin concentrated on one particular Indian and um, tracked him down. And so they eventually they were face to face. And Jacob Hamlin raised his gun to shoot this Indian, pulled the trigger, and his gun would not shoot. And of course, the Indian, this left the Indian to retaliate. And he had arrows. And so he started shooting arrows at Jacob Hamlin. And one went through his hat, Jacob says. Another went through his coat. He was trying to get his gun so he could shoot again. He got it so he felt he could shoot, raised it, pulled the trigger again. The gun would not shoot. And um, so he, he saw a big rock uh, on the ground. So he leaped down. He was a big man himself, six feet tall. He grabbed the rock and threw it at the Indian, hit the Indian. And so the Indian ran off. And um, so that was the end of this little confrontation. And he came back to camp, and he found out that all of his friends, kind of the same thing had happened. They tried to, to shoot these Indians and had not been able to inflict um, any deaths on these Indians. And in the, in the time after this, in the weeks and months after this, he, he had a kind of religious conversion. He kind of felt that this was a sign that God had given him, that he was not supposed to kill. Indians. Um, and he felt like God had given him a witness that if he did not seek the blood of Indians, uh, he would never be killed by them. And so he always felt like he had this, this pr protection from God whenever he was through the rest of his life, whenever he was in the Southwest, in very, very dangerous situations. And um, so af after this, he... Um, he wrote a letter to the Deseret News, and I'm, I kind of think it might have caught Brigham Young's eye. And in this letter, he kind of talked about how he felt people should deal with Indians, how they should befriend them, help them. He would, he would go and he would go on hunting trips with some of the Indians in, in Tuella. And so he was sent, um, in 1854, he was sent to southern Utah as part of the southern Indian mission. And they were supposed to go to the most southernmost part of, of Utah and start preaching to the Indians down there. And so um, the Iron Mission was going down there. And so there were people in Parowan, Cedar City, and Harmony. And so the, these Indian missionaries, there were about 20 of them, 
they went down to Harmony and started living there and started um, getting to know some of the Indians there, starting to get to know the language. And, um, but for some reason, Jacob Hamlin got very, very interested in the Indians south of there. Um, uh, what, south of the, the ridge of the Great Basin. And so he and a number of other mission, missionaries went down to where St. George is now, where St. Santa Clara is now, and visited the Indians um, on the Virgin River and on the Santa Clara River. And um, Jacob was very taken with these Indians, and they were very friendly to the Indian missionaries. And um, eventually, Rufus Allen, who was in charge of the Indian missionaries, he, he sent Jacob and a number of his friends to live down there in Santa Clara. Um, and that's how the town Santa Clara began. And that's where Jacob Hammond would live for the next uh, 10, 15 years or so. And um, so for the first part of his mission down there, he got to know the Indians. He helped them farm. Uh, they helped build dams on the Santa Clara River. And um, however, a after a few years, uh, he kind of became disillusioned with uh, the local Paiutes. And um, the, the cultural gap was tremendous between Mormons and Indians. And as we know, Indians uh, have a special place for Mormons because of the Book of Mormon. We see them as descendants of, of Israel who came from, from Jerusalem. And so many Mormons had great expectations, great hopes that these Indians would convert in mass and, and join the Mormons, um, join the Mormon settlements and become good farmers and become culturally just like us. And it did not happen like that. Um, sometimes we, there were baptisms, there were a number of baptisms, but the, the full conversions, uh, both to Mormonism and both to um, white culture, European culture, did not happen quickly. Um, and so Jacob Hamlin got interested, as well as Brigham Young, got interested in hearing, st they heard stories about the Hopis. Um, and so uh, they started Jacob Hamlin in 1858. He took a trip across the Colorado and visited the Hopi, Hopi Indians, the Hopi Mesas. And this was one of the great adventures in Southwestern history. It was um, very, very difficult. And uh, this was territory that there were no, no whites had not been there before. No whites had gone where Jacob Hamlin went before. Uh, Indians had. They were following, they had an Indian guide. They were following what they called the Ute Trail. Um, but it was a very difficult mission. And uh, so Jacob Hamlin is one of the great explorers of, of the Southwest. And so after that, he would take a trip across the Colorado every year. And in 1864, he made the first successful crossing at Lee's Ferry. Before that, they had crossed at the Crossing of the Fathers, uh, which was further northwest. And crossing at the Crossing of the Fathers was very, very difficult. Um, it added like six days to the journey. And uh, what would happen with these early journeys is they'd make it to the Hopi mesas. The Hopis were very generous, very hospitable, but they would have trouble getting food for their trip home from the Hopis. And because the Hopis themselves didn't have a lot of food. And on the way home, they would run out of water, they'd run out of food, and um, you'd have, they'd have very, very difficult times making it home. In that first 1858 trip, they, there were two parties. They separated, and both parties killed a horse, ate a horse. And they were on the brink of starvation. So these were very difficult journeys. Um, but finding a way across the um, Lee's Ferry, finding a way to get across Lee's Ferry, really cut off a lot of time from their journey, made it more practical. And it really opened up the the lifeline between southern Utah and Arizona. It opened up the, um, the, um, the Mormon colonies in, on the Little Colorado. Uh, 
Okay, so um, I mentioned that uh, that original conversion experience in Tooele inclined him to try to understand Indians, try to talk with them uh, when there's conflicts. And um, uh, around 1865-1866, the Black Hawk War started in Utah. And this was mainly a war between Utes and Mormons in central Utah. However, sometimes these Utes would um, uh, make allies of Navajos uh, in Arizona, northern Arizona. And uh, the Navajos began coming across the Colorado and raiding in Mormon territories. And as a result of this, um, Mormons would send military groups to punish the Navajos, to try to recover cattle and to um, kill the Navajos. And Jacob Hamlin got involved in this conflict, uh, once again in, in a military setting. And he came to have real misgivings about uh, working at it in this way in the military setting, as he was always kind of a counterbalance to the military solutions in, in Mormon leaders. And so he decided he would like to go visit, uh, go down to southern, uh, uh, northern Arizona and talk with the leaders of the Navajos and see if they could negotiate an end to these raids. And so um, he did this in 1870. And uh, his, the person who went with him was another fairly famous person in southwestern history, John Wesley Powell. As you know, John Wesley Powell had um, explored the Grand Canyon in 1869. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that Jacob Hamlin had um, boated on the Colorado from what we call the Grand Wash, which is south of St. Saint George, and he had boated down the Colorado all the way to what we call Colville, which is a ghost town right now. But, so he was the first one to boat on, on the Colorado. And um, when West, John Wesley Powell in 1869 came to Utah for his first expedition, he had gone to Salt Lake City and he had made friends with Mormon leaders and he said, here, here's the diary of Jacob Hamlin when he went down the um, part of, of the Colorado. And so Jake, uh, John Wesley Powell had that with him. And it was very important to him when he, he there were very um, difficult times toward the end of his trip. He was running out of food. He had conflicts with members of his group. And However, because he had this diary, he could tell them, look, if we get past this area right here, we can get through easily and um, you know, go down to the Virgin River and there's settlements on the, on the Virgin and on the Muddy. And, and so Jacob Hamlin was... Um, he, he kind of helped John Wesley Powell. So in 1871, Powell came back for a second expedition. And Brigham Young, he made friends, he was friends with Brigham Young, and Brigham Young said, why don't you um, work with Jacob Hamlin? He's a good Indian interpreter, knows the area. And so Jacob Hamlin and John Wesley Powell started years of working together, and Jacob Hamlin worked with Powell, and he also worked with all of the people who worked with Powell. And so he went with Powell to Fort Defiance in eastern Arizona to, to try to speak with the leaders of, of the Navajos. And uh, he took Powell to the Hopi Mesas, the first time Powell had been there. And then they went across the desert to Fort Defiance. And there um, the, the Nav Navajo, um, uh, what do they call the leader? white leader of the Navajo Reservation. Uh, anyway, his name was Frank Bennett. And he was friendly to Powell and friendly to Jacob Hamlin. And he called um, as many of the leaders of the, of the Navajos as he could together. And they had a meeting. We have a transcript of the meeting, you know, a very interesting historical document. And Barboncito of the Navajos spoke for the Navajos. And they arranged uh, peace. He told Jacob Hamlin, 
I'll do all I can to, to keep this raiding from happening anymore. Here's what you need to do, and so they worked it out. And um, so this was one of the great um, uh, successes of Jacob Hamblin's career as an Indian negotiator, Indian missionary. And in the years following that, that kind of helped open up the, the route to Arizona. And um, so Brigham Young sent colonies down on the Little Colorado. And eventually, Jacob Hamlin ended up on the Little Colorado on a colony there in Springerville, eager. And uh, took his, I've left his family out of this, but he had, he had a large family. He had plural wives. <coughs> And he took them with him down there to Arizona and then to um, New Mexico. And he was, since he was a polygamist, he had to worry about um, getting arrested, thrown into jail. And so he was often gone at this period. And he traveled down to Mexico. And the, the Mexican colonies were just starting, the Mormon colonies in Mexico. And I think he probably would have taken his family down to Mexico if he'd lived. However, in 1886, in New Mexico, he died. So that's, that's a brief overview of his life. I've left a lot out. Um, and you can fill in the details by reading the book. <laughs> um, so, uh, just a couple of the main themes uh, I wrote about in this book. Um, one is, I, one of the things I wanted to do in this book is kind of look at Jacob Hamlin in a larger context, not just in the context of Mormon history, but the context of Western history. And um, I got interested in Jacob Hamlin as a, as a hero. And um, early, fairly early in his life, he, he was well known in, in the Southwest. Um, Frederick Dellenbaugh, who was one of the people in the Powell, second Powell expedition, uh, I'll tell you this little story. He, he and his men were waiting at Lee's Ferry. They were waiting for um, people to come from Kanab with supplies. And uh, so they were just sitting there waiting. And one day they looked up across the river and there were three Indians mounted up there. And they didn't know what to think of that. And as I told you, there, was, there had been a lot of raiding. And then another man came up and called out in English, Good morning. <laughs> so they took a boat, went over, and picked up the Indians and the, the man who turned out to be Jacob Hamlin. And Dylan Boss said, I could hardly believe that this slow-speaking man in such plain clothes could be the famous Indian fighter and Indian manager Jacob Hamlin. And so this is a non-Mormon speaking in, when was it, 1871. Already by then he was well known. And so, um, but he's kind of a contrast to other Western heroes in many ways. In many ways, he's like them. Um, he was an explorer like Kit Carson. Uh, he spent a lot of time with Indians like Kit Carson did. He married an Indian wife like Kit Carson did. Uh, but in other ways, he's very different. And um, uh, Kit Carson and Buffalo Bill, another important hero, were famous for their how they fought with Indians. And they were also famous for their marksmanship. And um, I have some great pictures, uh, the iconography showing the mythology of the American hero, uh, such as Kit Carson and, and Buffalo Bill. And we have these dime novels, and they would have wonderful pictures on the front. And you have Kit Carson killing two Indians at once, at once with uh, knives. But you also have these pictures glorifying the marksmanship of Buffalo Bill, and Buffalo Bill would have these um, these Wild West shows. They would travel all over America and Europe. And the, the grand climax was the burning cabin. And what would happen is you'd have Indians attacking a burning cabin where you have these settlers um, hoping for some kind of help. And then here comes the cavalry, Buffalo Bill at the head of them with his gun. And you can see him shooting and Indians falling off horses and so on. And um, it's glorification of the gun. And of course, Buffalo Bill was in lots of marksmanship contests. He was very proud of his marksmanship. Contrast to that to the conversion story of Jacob Hamlin. Okay, 
Jacob Hamlin is, it's the story of the gun that would not shoot. <laughs> it's the anti-gun story. It's, he's like an anti-gun hero. And um, so I think he's quite an attractive Western hero who deserves to be better known than he is. Um, okay, um, Jacob Hamlin as explorer, I think, uh, deserves to be better known. Uh, Powell is very famous. Uh, a number of the other explorers in the West, like John uh, Christmas Ives, Joseph Christmas Ives, and um, some of the government explorers like Wheeler are well known. And, um, and Jacob stand, deserves to stand by their sides. And often he's kind of ignored because, you know, you have Mormon history is as often its own little ghetto and Western history is, you know, something different. And, um, but listen to this. I've written some of the things he did. Um, Jacob Hamlin was exploring the Grand Canyon country beginning in, you know, let John Wesley Powell started exploring the Grand Canyon in 1869. Uh, Jacob Hamlin started exploring the Grand Canyon country beginning in 1858 when he started making annual trips across the Colorado. He crossed the Colorado at the crossing of the Fathers in 1858, then he was first to cross at Lee's Ferry in 1864, and even now that area is the main thoroughfare between Utah and Arizona. He pioneered a crossing of the Colorado at Grand Wash, south of St. George. He was the first man to circle the Grand Canyon in 1862-1863. He boated, as I mentioned, he boated on the Grand Canyon in 1867. Um, and he became a guide and interpreter for John Wesley Powell. So I think he needs to be reassessed as an explorer. He um, needs to stand by the side of John Wesley Powell, not you know, in his shadow. Uh, Jacob Hamlin is a missionary. Here, I'm kind of, uh, I'm kind of on the revisionist side. And um, what happened was Brigham Young sent Jacob Hamlin and his friends down to, to Santa Clara to be Indian missionaries, which they did. But they also had to farm for themselves, which was a difficult thing to do. You know, but there are still a few Indian missionaries and lots of pilots on, on the Santa Clara. However, in 1861, Brigham Young sent some 300 and eventually 200 more, 500 men with their families to settle St. George. And he sent 90 Swiss converts to Santa Clara. And suddenly, Jacob Hamlin and his Indian missionaries were totally outnumbered by all these people who were supposed to, they had an economic mission, the cotton mission, and also the Indians were totally outnumbered all of these new Mormons. And so, looking at it from a Mormon perspective, you can kind of see it as a triumphalist kind of thing. You know, here's this wonderful, you know, incredible town starting immediately, you know, one of great, uh, Brigham Young's great triumphs. But from the perspective of the Indians, it was a disaster because all of these people, they kind of destroyed the ecosystem that the Paiutes were depending on. And um, so there was, a lot of competition for water. This was very an ar very arid place. Cotton took a lot of water. Um, and also, they brought a lot of cattle. And the, the Paiutes depended on uh, grass. They harvested grass at certain times of the year, and they um, made a lot of their food from this grass, from the seeds from the grass. And so, Jacob Hamlin understood that this was a disaster for the Pius. He wrote letters to Brigham Young. He wrote a letter to Powell in his um, autobiography. He talked about the fact that these Paiutes, they had lost their livelihood. They were starting to starve, literally starve. And um, so what had happened was you know, Santa Clara had started as an Indian mission, and all of a sudden it was a place that had an economic um, focus. And um, from the standpoint of the Santa Clara Indians, it was, it was a disaster. In addition, uh, and this was totally inadvertent, but the whites brought diseases and epidemics. And the, the Paiutes who were living there in Santa Clara, 
were almost wiped out by epidemics. Um, so I think I've used up my time. Um, story um, from the last part of his life. Um, he was at this point. He took his wife Louisa with her kids and visited Mexico, old Mexico, uh, and. Uh, at the time, the Apaches were very dangerous, and it was very dangerous to uh, go through southern Arizona, which is where they were going. And so everyone in the, there were like a couple of wagons, like 20 people in this group, was very on, very on edge. They were very nervous. And um, as they were going through these, these desert areas, all of a sudden they saw a line of Indians in the distance coming toward them. And um, they stopped, and all of, all of Jacob Hammond's family, they just, it says, they blinched. Because you know, they were worried this is going to be another Apache massacre. And Jacob Hammond looked carefully at them, and then all of a sudden, all of the Indians started to gallop as fast as they could forward to, to this company. And as they got closer, it turned out, they were Navajos, and the leader rode into the group, recognized Jacob Hamlin, jumped off his horse, and gave him a Navajo embrace. So instead of a massacre, it was an embrace. This was one of Jacob Hamlin's friends uh, named Haas Steele. And so um, it's, it's a nice image from the last part of his life that, you know, when um, many Mormons had lost patience with Indians and wanted uh, a military solution, wanted to kill Indians. Jacob Hammond um, tried to, to use diplomacy, um, work with the Indians, and help them. And um, at least, even though there were some successes and some failures, um, at some points he, he was able to help them and avoid violence on the frontier. So I hope you enjoy the book. Thank you. Yeah. Well, driving around some of the back roads around southern Utah, I stumbled across the Hamblin town site, a little cemetery. Do you have any interesting information that you could talk about that? And can you repeat the question? Yeah, sure. He said he'd visited the Hamblin town site in um, southern Utah. Just up from the mountain of Alaska, just right. a few miles from there. Yeah, um, yeah that was... <clears throat> Jacob Hamblin settled in, in Santa Clara, but he was given the rights to Mountain Meadows quite early on. And so he had his cattle up there, and there were cattle that weren't his own, but that he was taken care of. And so that was Hamlin's area. And he lived in the northern part of the um, Mountain Meadows. And um, so a, a little town grew up there, which was named after him. Uh, Did he have a home there? Pardon? And he, he had a home there, kind of a home. And at the time of the massacre, and what he would do is, during the heat of the summers, have any of you lived down there? Do you know how hot it gets? You know, they would joke about it. The pioneers would joke about it. They'd say, you know, it was 130 in the shade. The residents said it was cool, you know. <laughs> and um, so in the summers, he would bring his family up where it was a little cooler, you know, in the northern part of the Mountain Meadows. And so at the time of the Mountain Meadows massacre, his wife was there in the northern part of the, of the meadows. Um, he himself was in Salt Lake City marrying a plural wife. Okay, marrying his, at the time, his, his second wife, Priscilla. And so he was not involved in Mount Meadows Massacre. Um, Rachel heard it, and she received, actually, the survivors, someone brought uh, a wagon of the survivors to her house. You know, it was a, she, so she said, so she took care of him as best she could. Um, so I, am, I haven't been to Hamlin, so I'd like to go sometime. But there's a nice little cemetery there, but there's not much of It's hard to tell even where any homes were, but up on the hill, there's a nice little chain link fence, and, and the old uh, graves are still in really good shape. Uh -huh. Well, I'd like to go there sometime. He had a long standing relationship with uh, John D. Lee. Uh, <coughs> Would you mind talking about uh, their relationship? Yeah, well... Um, Did you uh, discuss that in your book? Yeah, 
a lot. Uh, he, as I say, he was not there during the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And, um, however, when he came back, he learned about it pretty quickly. And he said that John D. Lee told him about it. And he had an Indian son named Albert who took him to the site, and showed him the bodies, and told him about it. Albert was either a participant or a witness. And um, so Jacob Hamlin, um, he had had a good relationship with, with John D. Lee. He continued to have a relationship with John D. Lee and the other people who perpetrated the massacre. Um, and so he was an ally of John D. Lee for many years. And uh, he brought the message to Lee, you know, that why don't you go live at Lee's Ferry? It wasn't called Lee's Ferry then, but... <laughs> and that's why Lee came to Lee's Ferry. And, um, and then he would help Lee, and Lee would help him at times. And Lee eventually went down to Moanavi, uh, which was way down in Arizona, not too far from Tuba City now. And that was kind of like a Jacob Hamlin site, too. And so Jacob Hamlin was instrumental in that. I'm leaving out a lot. But, uh, however, in 1874, uh, Jacob Hamlin was involved in negotiations following um, what I call the Grass Valley killings, where three Navajos were killed up in Grass Valley, which is in kind of central Utah. And um, so Jacob Hamlin went down to, to, to talk with the Indians and explain to them that Mormons had not been involved in killing these Navajos. And while he went down there, he stayed at, at John D. Lee's house in Moanabi, and they had <coughs> major arguments. And Lee totally disapproved of the way Jacob Hamlin was handling things. And you can read about all this in Lee's um, uh, his diaries. Lee kept wonderful diaries, as you probably know. And after that, um, they were totally they were total enemies. They had a feud, and um, they forbid their children from socializing with each other. As a result, two of Lee's sons married two of. Hamlin's daughters. <laughs> um, but Hamlin testified against Lee in the second Lee trial. And Lee felt that, you know, Jacob Hamlin was lying the whole time. And um, so that was the end of that, that relationship. Um, did, uh, but it did wasn't Ham before 1874. Before 1874, they were allies. Did Hamlin give any idea about what... Uh, John D. Lee told him about the Mountain Meadows Massacre, or did he just mention it in passing? Did he give any details? Um, he said when he was coming down, you know, from his, from his time in Salt Lake City, and he had been up there with Indians to um, talk to Brigham Young with a number of these Indians in southern Utah, and to get married to Priscilla. On the way down, he ran into John D. Lee, and John D. Lee had told him that, uh, you know, that whites had been involved in the massacre. And he ran into Dame, William Dame. Is it William Dame? Yeah. Yeah. Who, who also was pretty forthright to Jacob Hamlin about what had happened. And so, uh, according to, to Jacob Hamlin, um, uh, John D. Lee had told him fairly early. And... In the trial, Jacob Hamlin said that, in the second trial of John D. Lee, he said that, that Lee had admitted to him killing two young women, two teenage girls. So, and as I told you, Lee himself totally you know, felt that all of Jacob Hamlin's testimony was, was a lie. And without getting into dynamics of that second um, Lee trial, which are very, very interesting, you know, and other people who are specialists in Mount Meadows Massacre, Massacre can tell you about it better than I can. Um, uh, Jacob Hamlin was, was a key witness. However, he wasn't an eyewitness. He was not there. He was just telling secondhand what people had told him. In the back, yes. <laughs>
Yeah, the, the question is, would things have been different if Jacob had been in southern Utah at the time of the, what later turned out to be the massacre? Uh, Frederick Dellenbaugh, I, I told you about him, he was one of the, uh, at the time, in the second um, Powell expedition, he was a young man in that expedition, and he became very close friends with Jacob Hanlon, and he said, <laughs> he said, if Jacob Hanlon had been there at the time, Mountain Meadows Massacre never would have happened. You know, but it's one of the big ifs of history, you know, you can play this if game all you want. What could... Jacob Hamlin have stood up against, you know, the, the major ecclesiastical and military leaders of Cedar City and Parowa. I don't know. Um, in many ways, he, 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 he did stand up to leaders at times, and he did this in Tuella. So you can say maybe he would have. On the other hand, at other times, he was a very loyal Mormon. He was a very loyal soldier of Brigham Young in many ways. As I told you, he disapproved of how um, of Brigham Young's settlement of St. George and um, Santa Clara and, and the impact it had on the local Indians. You know, but at the same time, he always continued to, to carry out the missions Brigham Young gave him and, and looked up to him as a prophet. So that's one of the great ifs of history. And, and you can write an alternate history you know, if you're a science fiction writer. <laughs> um, that I don't, no one knows. Dylan Bach felt that he would have prevented the massacre. Yeah, Mary Ellen. Um, you said that Jacob Hamlin married an Indian woman, is that right? Um, how common was that, and how did that go over in the Mormon community? Um, again, that's a long, complex question, and there's a guy named, oh, what is his name, Kitchener, who wrote a doctoral dissertation on this whole subject. Um, but, just to summarize as best I can, in, in the early um, part of the Indian mission, marrying Indian wives was more encouraged and more accepted, more accepted than in later times. When, uh, you know, when you have St. George and 90 Swiss uh, residents of Santa Clara, you know, whereas at first, you, you married an Indian wife and you were like part of the Indian culture. It helped you become part of their culture. It helped you um, be part of the family. Uh, and, you know, because Mormon men could be polygamous, you could have a white wife and also an Indian wife and so on. However, later, it was not accepted. It wasn't culturally accepted. Okay, and so in Jacob Hamlin's case, his family later denied that he had had Indian, an Indian wife or wives. And so later, and this is evidently very common, you know, in the early part of settlement of an area, uh, the, the explorers took Indian wives. But when, you know, you, you had a town or a city, then it was not accepted. And in fact, there was a derogatory term. Squaw man. And so Jacob Hammond's family wanted to say, no, he wasn't a squaw man. And so they denied that he had been, that he had married uh, an Indian wife. But it's, it's quite well documented. Uh, Dellenbaugh wrote, when Jacob Hammond was in Kanab, he had <laughs> two, two um, Paiute women who he, he was married to. And you say, well, Dellenbaugh. He wasn't a Mormon. Did he know what was happening? And um, then you can say, well, maybe because he was a non-Mormon, he felt like he could talk about it where the non-Mormons didn't want to talk about it. Um, his, the first, his first wife, uh, Indian wife, um, her name, we know her, was Eliza. The story is that she had been brought up in his home. And then he uh, married her. And, but uh, apparently... Rachel, his wife at the time, didn't realize that, that she had been married to Jacob. And at one point, Eliza said, I'm as much his wife as you are. And However, she never had any children. And eventually, she left the family. And the story is that she left. Uh, it wasn't that Jacob Hamlin uh, kicked her out or anything like that. She decided to leave. So that's 
in a nutshell, that's the story. <coughs> it would be great to have more insight on that. Um, Ivans in Signature Books is publishing the diary of Ivans. He was down here in St. George. But he came, his father was, um, his father worked um, laying out towns, Tony Ivan's father. And so they came to Santa Clara to help lay out the town. And he says, Jacob Hamlet had, uh, <laughs> he had an Indian <coughs> wife, which was, you know, I was quite surprised. And he said, she made us um, mush. It was the best mush I'd ever eaten. <laughs> so... You know, it's quite well it's quite well documented from a number of sources at the same time that later it became something that you know Hamlin's family didn't want to talk about and apparently none of his wives had children if you have a wife who has a children a child they kind of it's in it gets into the genealogy but apparently they never had children at least that I know about so he had two wives you say he had there, there's one well-documented wife in Santa Clara, and Tellenboss said there were two in Canab. I heard John D. Lee had 19. So well, he had 19 heard, wives. 19 wives, but uh, Jacob, I didn't know. I haven't studied him. I don't think he married any Indian wives. Huh. Um, Dudley Levitt, who was uh, Juanita Brooks, was the grandfather of Juanita Brooks. Um, he, he had an Indian wife, and whole very interesting story that she tells in a very interesting way in her biography of Dudley Levitt uh, on the Ragged Edge, which I'm sure you have her someplace, hopefully. <laughs> in, in that early phase, they were encouraged to have Indian wives. Well, That's how they were going to become white and delights. There, there was encouragement from the brethren, from Brigham Young and, and Heber C. Kimball. There was some encouragement for that in, in the early times. There, his family tells the story at one point, Brigham Young encouraged Joseph, Joseph and, uh, Jacob to take an Indian plural wife. And Jacob, according to the family, Jacob said, uh, Brigham, when you take one, I'll take one. <laughs> you know, that's the story the family tells. Yes. Vance. Do you know if uh, that Indian wife was ever sealed to him in the temple? He, she came up here to, to Salt Lake City and not in the temple, but in yeah. Or Council. possibly endowment house, possibly the uh, Brigham Young's office. Where did they have marriages at the time? But there was a formal wedding, and there's a record of it. So she's kind of a tragic figure. Uh, the, the marriage did not work out. And according to according to the story, she married a local Indian uh, man. I, I really wonder, because she had been raised as a white, I wonder what that would have been like to go back into the, the Paiute culture again. I think it must have been very difficult for her. So she's kind of a tragic, interesting figure. Any others? I have one more. Okay, um, let's, let's make this the last one. On, on this book, as well as the others, has anyone ever approached you and said, hey, I know this is history, but maybe we should sugarcoat this and not write about it. Have you been approached that way by Mormons or by other authors with this kind of history? No. no. I haven't had a lot of um, a lot of interchange with Jacob Hamlin's um, descendants. Uh, a little bit, not a whole lot. And uh, I, I gave it, there's a Jacob Hamlin family organization, and I gave the manuscript to him to read, kind of a little nervous, you know, because I try to be honest about everything, though I'm very, I'm quite positive about Jacob Hamlin. Have you picked that up? <laughs> um, you know, but I'm quite honest about some, some elements of, of his life and some elements of the Mormon settlement of Southern Utah. You know, but he, he really liked it, so I was, I was glad that he liked it. I hope that... The family likes it. Are there any descendants of Jacob Hamlin here? No, not here. Okay. Just uh, one question. You were <clears throat> alluding to the Paiute Indians. My understanding that if the Indians that were in the Great Basin here, that the Paiutes were considered by the other Indians to be one of the lower classes. In other words, the Utes and the Shoshone and 
the Navajos and the Hopis all thought the Paiutes were kind of the, the scrubs of the bunch. Is that, is, did your history kind of present that? I'm kind of bringing up a point. Is that? Do we have another half hour? <laughs> <laughs> right, the question was, I'll try to answer briefly. Uh, were, the Paiutes were kind of looked down upon by the, the Utes and the Shoshones as kind of a lesser form of Indian. Uh, it's interesting what happened in Utah. Um, you, you have the Utes uh, in through central Utah, and they were in um, Utah Valley, uh, Timonogos Utes at the time, and um, they were horse Indians. And the same with Shoshone in northern Utah and, and Idaho. They were, they were horse Indians. And if you owned a horse, you were wealthy. It's kind of the same thing in ancient Greece, uh, which I studied in school. Uh, if you owned a horse, you were kind of in the upper class. And the Paiutes and the Goshutes in, in Tuella, they were not horse Indians. And so they were just not as wealthy as the, the Utes were. And if you had horses, you could raid. You could go into, you know, some of the Utes went into California, and raided and got lots of horses there and came back to Utah. And you could, you could capture what, they, what the Utes did. They would go to the... To, Goshutes or the Paiutes, who were not as powerful as they were, not as wealthy, didn't have, they weren't as well um, equipped with guns, and they would capture kids and women, and then they would take them and say that, sell them as slaves into New Mexico or to the Navajos. And so, uh, for for some reason, the the Paiutes and the Goshutes never did become horse Indians, and some people say they're perpetually on the edge of starvation if they did get an animal, like a horse, they would often eat it. You know, that was their first impulse to, to eat it. And um, so um, that, that's the short answer for that. And the Paiutes were quite, you know, their language was quite similar to the Ute language. And so there's a lot of interchange between Ute and Paiute. You know, but they, they were, their culture was, had not been transformed by the, the horse. In, in the history of the American Indian, the horse was an incredible, you know, technological um, change for their lives. You know, you have people like the Comanches, and before they had horses, they were, I, I think, like the Paiutes, and they got horses, they got a number of horses and became great horsemen. Then they could raid, and um, all of a sudden, they were some of the most powerful Indians in, in American history. And so, but... At that, at, at Jacob Hamlin's time, the Paiutes were not, you know, they're not horse Indians, and they were quite um, impoverished compared to the Utes. Uh, the reason I brought that up, my my mother was born and raised in Newcastle, which is just north mm -hmm. of the Hamlin right. thing, and she recalls when she was a little girl that her father told her how impoverished the Paiutes were, and they used to come on their farm, and he would always trade food to them for what trinkets that they would come by. There was a particular Indian that would come with a couple of squaws. And she said, I never knew why they were so impoverished, but you were talking about, I mean, apparently in my history, they were poor to begin with. And then after the colonization of Santa Clara and St. George, it made it even worse. And so into the 20th century, it, it became it's still very profound. As she remembered, but my grandfather apparently had a, a, a very soft spot for what they were going through, from what she told me. Yeah. It's very interesting. Many Mormons were very sympathetic to Indians. And other Indians kind of had these typical American, and other Mormons had this very typical view, American view of Indians as, you know, if someone kills an Indian, you're doing everyone a favor. And so Mormons had that point of view. And so you have great variation among Mormons. You know, and of course, Jacob Hamlin was among those who were more sympathetic toward the Indians. Thank you very much. Let's give you another hand.